Thank you, Anna. So thank you so much for coming tonight. We have um, three very talented Singaporean authors here, which I'm sure all of you have burning questions for them. Um, we will kick off with a reading, as Anna mentioned. Um, what I'm going to do now is introduce you to each of them, and then they will do their reading and tell us a little bit why about uh, tell us why they've chosen that particular bit. Then we will move on to talk about some interesting topics, and then we'll open some questions to the floor. Okay, um, let's start with Charlene. So this is Charlene Teo over here. Hi. Um, <laughs> Charlene was born in Singapore and lives here in London. She completed an MA and PhD at the University of East Anglia, Anglia where she received the UEA Booker Scholarship and the David T.K. Wong Creative Writing Fellowship. Her debut novel, Ponty, won the in inaugural Deborah Rogers Writers Award. And it was shortlisted for the Hurstvig Book Award, longlisted for the Jalak Prize, and selected by Ali Smith as one of the best debut works of fiction in 2018. Hi. Um, so Ponty is about a failed horror movie actress called Amisa Tan, who in the late 70s to early 80s makes a trilogy of um, horror movies about a Pontianak, so that's the Southeast Asian monster, man-eating monster. So I'm just reading a short section from near the end of the book, just for fun. <laughs> 2003, Amisa's whole body hurt up to her eyeballs, and she was so, so tired. She needed a drink, and she was out of cigarettes. The sun glared in the garden and would scorch her skin if she went out at this hour. Yunsi was stuck in the session room with a neurotic and profoundly irritating woman. Amisa sat up in bed and watched the light shifting on the dusty window pane perhaps because her husband Wei Long had left for good and she no longer bothered with men, she indulged in wondering about Iskander Wayanto. He had left Singapore almost two decades ago. He would be an old man now. She said these lines to him in her head. Do you know who I am, Iskander Wayanto? Nobody does. I'll never be famous. I am 43 and utterly unknown. Also obscure, Iskander Wayanto. Your name means nothing to anyone else. She got up and felt the blood rush to her head, and her legs almost gave way. Water, she probably needed water. She went to the hallway and stopped outside Sue's door. Her daughter had her friend over again, that annoying girl whose name Amisa could never remember. Teenage habits mushroomed and rotted in the fierce hothouse privacy of that bedroom. Stuck to its wooden door was a do not enter danger zone sign, and below that, a half-scratched-off Spice Girls sticker that had gradually lightened under the, under the glare of Sue's embarrassment. I never loved the Spice Girls, she now claimed. They were okay only. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Charlene. <laughs> and now, now I'm going to introduce you to Jingjing Jing Lee over here. Jingjing Jing was born and raised in Singapore as well. She obtained a master's degree in creative writing from the University of Oxford in 2011 and has since seen her poetry and short stories published in various journals and anthologies. How We Disappeared is her first novel. She currently lives in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, How We Disappeared is about um, Wang Ti, who in the year 2000 is an elderly lady who has to come to terms with her past during World War II. And um, alongside Wang Ti, there's Kevin, who's on the cusp of turning into a proper teenager, and he has to find out his grandmother's past. Um, and I will read from the first two pages because simply, I think it gives a very clear picture of who Wang Di is as a person and what her role is like within her family and society. She began in the first month of the lunar year. They said she was born at night, the worst time to arrive, used up all the oil in the lamp so her father had to go next door for candles. It took hours, and it was only after muddying up swaths of moth-eaten sheets the neighbors had given in the last few weeks of her mother's pregnancy that she emerged. As the first whales cracked through the hot air in a tap hut, he went into the bedroom to look at her, a worm of a thing freshly pulled out of the earth. 
when he saw the gap between the baby's legs. The first time father spat, then slumped in a chair at the kitchen table, eyeing his wife as she nursed, already thinking about the next child. That is one story. Or she began when her mother found her in a rubbish skip. She was walking to the market with four eggs her hands laid that morning, it was passing by the public bins when it started to whimper. The woman looked in, and there it was, a child, scraps of leftover dinner on top of it. She took the baby home and brushed the dirt off her face, waited for a week to see if anyone would come and claim her. They kept her when no one did. The third and last story, told to the, aunt, uh, told to the child by her aunt, was that she was born and her father took her to the pond, the one where water spinach grew. Village, villagers went to collect it in armfuls when they could afford nothing else for dinner. And it was by this vegetable, completely hollow in the middle to, of the stems, so as to warrant the name Kong Xin, empty heart, that her, that her father put her. The aunt told the story each time she went to visit. And each time, as she got to this point in the story of her niece's birth, she would stop, smack her lips, and lean in close, adding that her father had tried to push her under with the tip of his sandaled feet. She explained that it, was, it wasn't easy, what he was doing, because the water was shallow and the weeds were holding her up. You were bobbing in and out of the water, she said, and the whole business was almost finished with when you stopped crying from the feeling of damp on your body and simply looked at him. Your eyes opened up a crack and you just stared into his face. The aunt couldn't say why, but it made the new father take the child back home again. He put the bundle on the table like a packet of biscuits and told his wife that she could keep her if she gave birth to a baby boy next year. They didn't bother naming the girl for a few weeks, but when they did, they named her Wang Di to hope for a brother. Thank you, Jing Jing. Next, we have Cheryl here. Um, Cheryl is a New York-based journalist and author of the international bestsellers Sarong Party Girls and A Tiger in the Kitchen, A Memoir of Food and Family. New York Magazine named Tiger one of the top 25 must-read food memoirs of all time. She is also the editor and of the fiction anthology Singapore Noir. Thank so you. Cheryl is going to, going to be reading from Sarong Party Girls, which has just been published here in the UK. So, um, the Sarong Party Girl, if you haven't been to Singapore, is a kind of woman that's existed for a very long time in Singapore. And when I was growing up, it was a very, very derogatory term. Um, it's a kind of woman who wants to meet an expat and date and marry him. Um, and I always wondered why this type of person existed. Um, and then when I was home um, doing research for a tiger in the kitchen, I would spend my days in the kitchen with my aunties and my grandmother, and at nights with my, with my childhood girlfriends, who had declared themselves modern SPGs. And the way they explained it, it was, uh, it was more about power, not so much about status, but it was about, the more they explained it, uh, I kind of felt like it was about uh, sort of post-colonial sort of post -colonial sort of gender and racial politics playing itself out in modern Singapore in a way. Um, and it sort of came to a head, I realized I needed to write this book when a friend of mine said, um, well, it's about, having, it's about getting that Chanel baby, right? You know, it's a, it's a, and I'm like, what's a Chanel baby? And she said, uh, it's that half Singaporean, half Ang Mo, which is a uh, uh, Caucasian baby. It's the Chanel of babies. So once she said that, I wrote it down and I decided I had to write this book. Um, but these SPGs in here are not the traditional SPGs and uh, I'm gonna read a little section that sort of explains it. Um, when we were in secondary school, we didn't see Emo's dad very much. Uncle was always traveling for work. Each week, he would disappear for a few nights, often over the weekend. So every time we were at her house, it was mostly just us hanging out with Auntie. Auntie never seemed to mind, though. Whenever Uncle came back from his travels, he always brought something nice. Sometimes got duty-free perfume, la. Other times, if he disappeared for longer trips, he would actually come back with a Prada handbag, that kind of thing. Uncle was so boring that we definitely didn't think about him very much. But then, right after we graduated from JC, Uncle and Auntie sat Emo down after dinner and said, we have something to tell you. Emo said everything happened very quickly. Once Uncle started talking, everything also just anyhow come out. Apparently his job was actually not a traveling type of job. He worked in a local insurance office. First, he said, Imogen, you know your mommy and I love you very much, right? Everything you want, we also give you. But then Uncle said, now that you're old enough, almost a woman already, your mommy and I thought you should know something. You have two brothers. 
Emil was quite confused. She didn't know what he meant. But how could my mom have two kids that I don't know about? Cannot be. She had me when she was so young, and then I don't remember her being pregnant anymore. Where got two sons? I have another family, Uncle said. Emil looked across the dinner table at her mom, who was looking a bit blank-faced, except that her eyes were staring down. She said Auntie was looking hard at her fingers, which were pulling apart at one corner of the very carefully ironed white tablecloth that she spent four months last year crocheting. This was the tablecloth that Auntie cared about so much that she even bought a special clear plastic cover for it for Chinese New Year. So that when people brought curry or whatever over, her tablecloth will still be number one okay. So Imo knew that if her mom was actually cho with this tablecloth, then confirmed this conversation is really serious. <laughs> Uncle continued, when I met your mom, I already had one son, and then just around the time you were born, I had my second son. They look a bit like you, actually. Imo is usually quite tootla, so at this point, when she told all of us this, we thought the situation was quite clear. But Imo was still confused. She asked her dad, but you had your mistress before mom? She wasn't getting anything at all. When she told me, sure, and fun, all of this, my God, we all just wanted to reach over and slap her one time. Where got people so stupid? That was when Uncle looked a bit embarrassed, and she said her mom by this time couldn't even look up from the tablecloth. Emo, I care about your mom very much, and I care about you very much. The two sons I have are with my wife. They live here in, well, a town center quite far from here, so, now that, so you were definitely never in the same schools. But now that you are all grown up, have wings, can fly already, we wanted you to know that you have brothers out there. Ju you, just, ay, you just never know. Now that you're older, going out, dating, dating all, scarly something weird happens. Better be safe. So we thought we should sit you down and tell you everything. If you have news about any guys you are meeting, might be getting serious with, you just be sure to keep, keep us informed, okay? <laughs> come, come, let's eat some oranges. And then after that, Emo's mom just got up, peeled two oranges for them, went to her room, turned on the TV, and they didn't talk about it anymore. Walao eh, crazy la. When Emo told us, we weren't quite sure what to say or think. But we hugged her, and we looked at each other. She smiled, reached over, and squeezed her hand and said, Hey, Emo, you're lucky you're a sarong party girl. Like that, you confirm won't end up kissing your brother by mistake. <laughs> so ever since then, Emo has been quite determined. Get an angmo husband or bust man. Okay, so on that note, I think um, with that very Singaporean tone, I think my question now is to Singlish or not to Singlish, <laughs> okay? So with, with, e with each of the books, um, I think also with Cheryl's book in particular, the narration in there is, is very strong Singlish. There, there's a big use of that there. And the other two books here, um, they, have, they use Singlish and colloquialisms in the dialogue. So maybe we can talk about that. Why don't we start with you, Cheryl? Um, why did you choose to write it with such a local tone? Um, I, I hate the answer I always give, actually. But um, when I first thought about writing SPG, I thought about writing it as, um, as nonfiction. And it wasn't coming out right. And then I had something due, I had promised my agent uh, a proposal, and it wasn't coming out. And so it was sort of this sort of panic moment where I'm like, well, you know, I have the characters in my head, blah, blah, blah. Why don't I just sit down and see how they come out? And, um, and so I basically wrote the first chapter very quickly, and it was, it was entirely in Singlish. And it was actually much more hardcore than this. So the revisions were about kind of peeling it back a little bit. Charlene? Um, I, I think for me, um, I, I think um, how, how characters speak doesn't really reflect how they actually speak like in real life. So I thought of it as just in terms of tonal slippage or like in and out of um, Singlish or more standard, standardized English, it just depended on um, what needed to be said. Um, so, so like looking at the dialogue as more, more a question of um, subtext and, and context and what was going on there. And then just kind of intuiting what people would be saying that sounded plausible to me, like how two schoolgirls in Singapore would speak. You know, they wouldn't be, you know, using particular, a particular register that was too elevated or like, so it has to be kind of realistic. So that's, that's the way that I went about it. I did definitely like sense, like speak it out loud <laughs> for dialogue, yeah. And there's some, some use of it for you. Yeah, not a um, lot. I think I dialed back on the use of English because I was raised in 
Mandarin, speaking Mandarin. So my parents weren't great speakers of English in the first place. And growing up with my family, who are mostly very, um, most of them are Chinese educated. So the book came to me more as, um, in my head at least, a translation from Chinese or Hokkien dialect. So with Singlish, it only came in bits where Kevin, the, the, the 12 year old boy, was, was talking to his teachers or his friends. That's when it came out a tiny bit. And the, most of it, most of the dialogue came out as, in my head, it was um, from the Chinese translated into English. So that's why I didn't use Sing I didn't have the opportunity to use English all that much. Um, yeah, but I do really very much ad admire Cheryl's use of English. She was so consistent. Yeah. <laughs> and you really need to be very much kind of in that zone in, in order to write it like that. Because I would have to be in Singapore to do that, I think. And I, I thought, yeah. um, I, I thought also on that note that it, it was it was so yeah so brilliantly consistent and yeah. also so so very kind of to me fundamental to the telling of the story because um, I felt the narrator Jazzy she's oftentimes telling you without telling you um, very very sad things but because you get so used to her tone this very very jocular kind of colloquial tone mm -hmm. that kind of makes it sadder you know it kind of adds depth depth to the character so I thought it really really worked yeah, in, in that regard yeah. But I also I also love Singlish, and I don't and I would love for everyone I know to be able to speak some Singlish. So <laughs> part of that was was this. Um, but you know, Singlish is very uh, it's very direct, it's very crude, it's beautifully funny sometimes, um, and I think it's very reflective of uh, of, of the very fundamental Singaporean personality sometimes. And um, and you know, like and my my friend my family tries not to speak Singlish. So actually, my dad was the first person to read this book, and he was very unhappy with it. And he summoned me to lunch, and he was like, "Who taught you to speak like this?" <laughs> so I'm supposed to speak proper English. Yeah. So, but as Singaporean authors, did you feel that because you were launching your books on the international stage, did you have to dial back a little bit because you were launching it overseas? Um, I think that, that that kind of speaks to a perceived readership, which I, I hope doesn't like get in the way of the actual writing process. Because I think if, if someone was thinking about kind of perceived readerships and, and on, on a wider scale, like the idea of markets and the literary marketplace, then nothing would get written. Or we'd constantly be trying to write to the trend, and by the time you finished it, then like, you know, you'd be three steps behind. So I think it was just like what was plausible to me. Like when I was a kid, I used to watch those cartoons that were dubbed, like Japanese cartoons, like mangas or whatever, and they're dubbed in American, and the, the mouth is moving, but then like different, different sound is coming out. So like that's, that's my idea of like hell. It's like I wrote something and it just came out really horrible and clunky. So like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the question was anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it just it makes me nervous. Yeah. Like, yeah, bad dialogue, I don't know. I don't know. I think I would not be able to write a word if I had to think about it's an international stage. Um, I didn't even dare to think about a readership when I started the book. It's, I think it's natural to want to connect with readers on some level, but then <laughs> I write for myself. I write the book that I want to read. Um, I also write the book that, um, I write from a point of view of a character most of the time, and it's about hearing the character's voice. So if I listen too much to what I think readers want to read, I can't hear the character's voice. And I can't hear my own voice as well. Yeah, I, yeah. I think on that note, um, maybe we can talk about some of the challenges you face as Singaporean authors um, breaking into the international market. Um, how, what kind of loops you had to jump through or hurdles that you had to cross I think I, I mean, for me at least, I had a bit of a lucky break because I came at the heels of crazy rich Asians and people were quite interested in the whole Singapore narrative, except that mine was quite different. So the only difficulty I had was convincing, trying to convince people that it's not just crazy rich Asians. <laughs> there are all sorts of other Singaporeans. We are more than crazy rich. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, I, yeah, for me that was that was the main thing. It was um, a lot of people expected the, the the Singaporean author to want to write about the same topic, but of course it's, the stories and Singapore are so diverse, and it's not just about one thing, of course. 
Yeah, I, I agree with the two of you just now about your answer um, with, ha with writing and not writing to an audience. Um, but also with regard to, and I feel like it's sort of you know, the same Link. question yeah. in a way. Um, I mean, for me, I feel very lucky. I, I, you know, I grew up reading Enid in, in Blyton books, and I, that made me, at age five, want to write books. And then I just kind of forgot about it because you know, your, your dad says, you, you can't do that. You have to figure out a way to make money first. <laughs> so I'm like, I'll be a journalist. I can write and make money. Um, and then so I was a journalist, and I loved it. And, um, but the more I lived away from Singapore, the more I missed it. So actually, what brought me to, to writing books um, was really just sort of really missing Singapore very, very intensely. Um, and I wrote one food essay. I was primarily a fashion writer at the time. I wrote one food essay and a book editor called and said, let's turn this into, about, about going back, traveling back to Singapore and learning how to make my late grandmother's pineapple tarts um, for Chinese New Year. And um, I wrote about what I learned about my grandmother in that process. And a book editor called and said, let's turn this into a book. And then my book career sort of launched. So when people ask me, how do you get into books? I'm like, I don't really know. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Write about something you really, really love in a way that nobody's really heard about before, read about before. And you know, maybe lightning will strike. I, I feel very lucky. And um, I actually think that like the the question of sort of obstacles and and stuff like it's so individual so it's it's quite quite hard to theorize like generally but I think as a, uh, um, it's a pretty good time to be a Singaporean writer now or even um, like a kind of writer of color as they, as they call it because I think there's a great cultural appetite right now um, not just for um, writers writing from different countries. Um, previously marginalized or not so exposed, but also to uh, different works of translation. And I think there's a lot of appetite now for poetry as well. So I think that there's, there's a great kind of um, widening of tastes. So like, that, that's, that's only good for, for us, because with that widening of taste comes less kind of, um, of an imposition of particular kind of templates of how you should and shouldn't be writing to, to a readership. Yeah. What about as, as a writer in general, where do you get inspiration from? I mean, how do you get inspired to write a novel? Um, I noticed, I mean, for each of the books that we're talking about today, they're all set in Singapore. Um, but it's just in general, I mean, how do you like keep going? Where do you get your ideas from? Well, I like to joke that I write because I can't do anything else, <laughs> but it's actually true. Um, I, I'm useless at everything else. Uh, so. But I, I write because I listen to a voice and I want to follow the voice. And uh, this, uh, that's how this book came about. Um, the voice um, was of an elderly woman. I wrote about her in a short story, but I couldn't stop thinking about her. So when I write something, it's, it usually has to do with somebody's voice. Um, and for you as well, I mean, I, I think you had to do a lot of research, right? Yeah, that was the painful bit. Um, that was hard, hard, hard work. And um, having done the research, I'm grateful for um, all the archives that I could access. And um, getting to the point where I find um, the stories of women behind those like kind of tepid history texts, that's where you kind of find a story. It's when you, I, I got most of my information from facts from um, Korean comfort, uh, former comfort women. So it was them that I listened to for much of the World War II scenes. Yeah. Well, um, I find Singapore endlessly fascinating. Um, and it, all my books are set there. And the one I'm working on now is also set there. Um, it, it's, I think I, um, the older I got, and but because I was living away for so long, whenever I went home, I would sort of pick things up, sort of with this sort of journalist eye, uh, you know, the way the things people said, the way they thought, um, you know, the, what they, when I, people would say something really funny or very uniquely Singaporean, I would write it down and like think about it for a long time. Um, but also, I think it comes from having lived in the States for so many years, I've lived there for a very long time now, um, but my whole family still lives in Singapore. And, um, and having to explain Singapore to Americans for so long. You know, when I first moved there, they're like, oh yeah, caning, you know, you, you really banned chewing gum and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and they still <laughs> ask me those questions. Um, so I'm like, Singapore is about much more than that. You know, we, we, are, we are very, very funny people. We're very kiasu, we're very like, we're very this, we're very that. Um, and, uh, and it's a very, very, very unique culture that a lot of 
uh, a lot of Americans, a lot of the wider world doesn't always see because you don't spend enough time in Singapore, you just fly in and out. And so I feel like I would, I want my books to kind of, you know, show those little worlds, you know, that, you know, that, that other people might not see if you're just sort of in Singapore for two days for a business trip. Charlene, anything to add? Um, I, I think, I think that people's personalities, like their kind of subconscious impressions and their like true cultural tastes are all formed in the first 15 years of their life. I mean, this, this is not a scientific fact, but I'm just making it sound like <laughs> it is. Anyway, 15 years and three months. After that, you're, you're done. So basically, if you're, if you're not an interesting person by the time you're 15 and three months, then you're toast. Um, <laughs> but basically, because I, I spent um, up till I was 19 in Singapore, so it's very deeply embedded in my subconscious. And I think the most interesting parts of myself, i.e. like my childhood, and dreams and like this weird kind of moldy 90s Singapore with like, you know, the gritty tiles and stuff and all the, obviously all the food and like fish cakes and things like that, like bubble tea. It's all like, that's probably the most interesting parts of me and like anything else I add on as an adult is just a shadow of that, you know? Like the way how I, f I feel you form your literary taste, your musical taste when you're young and then everything else, you're like, oh, I like this when I'm 53, but it's because it sounds like something, it reminds you of something that you, you encountered when you were 12. Yeah, I think nostalgia yeah. obviously plays a big part um, in all three of your books. And mm. But before we get on to that, I just wanted to ask you as well, um, how much of you is there in the book for Ponty? Me, me. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's very interesting. I feel that this is a question that's mo more often posed to female writers. Mm. Um, the idea of conflating like fiction with autobiography or a biography or a subconscious biography in some way which I think like, takes out the autonomy of, of the writer in, in just assuming that female writers, oh, life happens to them, then they transcribe it. Like, this is my diary. I mean, th th I'm, I'm not putting on you for posing that question. <laughs> I, I get asked it all the time, but, which um, I, I would say like, I mean, I went to a girl's school and, and you know, I was kind of like sweaty and angsty and stuff when I was a teenager as well. So I, I guess that bit of it and often angry. So I think a lot of these characters are angry and hungry and, yeah, who isn't? So yeah. <laughs> is there is there a little bit of yourself in any of the books that you've written? You think? I find I always have to explain to one really weird guy in the audience that all my <laughs> SPG thinks that I am not jazzy. <laughs> um, and um, but I mean I you know I I'm, re I'm really not jazzy. Um, and but you know there's some characters in the book that obviously you know the the book was so, was researched while I was researching Tiger in the Kitchen. I was literally in the kitchen at, at during the day and like hitting these bars and clubs with my my girlfriends whom I knew since I was six at night. <clears throat> and just sort of like listening to them and watching the scenes and like um, just writing things down and, and um, so you know some of the characters in here might be composites of people I know um, but none of them are me really. Um, I have to admit that I used my mother's name for Wang Ti. So her name That's is not Wang Ti but it's very close and she was named because my grandparents were hoping for a brother but there is very little that's autobiographical in the book. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and also, um, with these books, women are very central to it. Um, let's talk about how incredible women are, <laughs> <laughs> or, or you know, why we portray them in our books as such. I think we can only start to do that by portraying how they were perceived. Um, in during times when they were seen as nothing but dirt, which is how one, which is how one was treated, um, and to have her kind of, in the end, begin to think about even telling her story is a, a, an enormous, an enormous deal for her, a, f a woman of her generation. Um, but yeah, I did not set out to write. Again, it's, it's hard to kind of sit down and write a book about this theme or that theme. You write a book that you can only write about. So I, I think in writing this book, it was, I, I partially wanted to portray what, uh, what life was like for women in the 50s, 60s, and also par partly in contemporary Singapore. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I, I've heard quite a few times that a Singaporean publisher say 
slightly triumphantly that he did not want to publish books about uh, your grandmother's stories anymore. And I thought, okay, it's interesting that he said grandmother, and not grandfather or your father. So yeah, that's a kind of a hidden misogyny beneath mm -hmm. Singapore society that's not often talked about. Yeah, mm, and that was actually a huge um, reason I wrote this book as well. Um, because it, it was sort of, I wanted to address uh, the misogyny that is there, you know, the glass ceiling that's so low, um, you know, just the, the little things that you face at every, t that you can face at every turn, um, you know, if you're, if you're a woman in Singapore. Uh, I'm not saying every woman experiences all the things that Jazzy experienced in this book, but, you know, it, it's, you know, it, uh, it's, it's, it's there. And I, I, I didn't want it to be sort of swept under the rug. And um, so my characters, my female characters ended up being quite, you know, very sort of strong, fierce women because they have to deal with this and it's either do or die. Um, and, um, and, and Jazzy is kind of very much that way. She's trying to succeed in a, in a world that um, isn't always built uh, to help women succeed very easily the way it is, um, you know, built to help men succeed very easily. Yeah, um, well, I think um, cultural perceptions of Singapore and Singaporean identity and Singaporean people tend to be quite schematic. So it's either like people that are super like organized and efficient, that, that one way, or the other way, the really broad um, viewpoint, I think, sometimes of perceived of all Asian women, not just Singaporean women, um, a very Orientalist viewpoint of like, you know, delicate peony ladies who like don't sweat and stuff like that. So like, <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted disgusting, like, you know, bodily realities of, of women who swear and curse and sweat and shit and like, you know, are very, very deeply human and kind of flawed and all the wonderful things that that entails. And also, um, I think the idea of something passing the Bechdel test, you know, like these women talking about things that don't involve a man um, or, or kind of sexual politics in any way. Um, I think that's very interesting uh, to unpick in fiction. Um, I mean, if you look at, I mean, the, the kind of trend very much led by Elena Ferrante, who I love, I mean, um, there's so much more complexity there. And the idea of um, friendships eroding and how women view other women um, and younger women view older women, older women view younger women. There's so, so much going on there. And it's, it's a little bit erotic, it's a little bit competitive. It's, it's just endlessly fascinating. Yeah. Okay, and um, with that, I thought that maybe we could now open up some questions to the floor, um, if we're ready for that. And we can get more conversation going as well. I'm sure all of you have some burning questions. We have a question right here in front. Just Just hang on, we have a mic coming to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to hear you all talk and very much enjoyed your books. Just on the topic we're on at the moment, just to knock this one on the head quickly, I wanted to ask you, you made a very interesting observation about being asked those kind of questions and that female writers do tend to be more than men. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that in terms of what you think the impact is on the work. You talked about there being an impact on the autonomy of the writer. What, what can you say about the impact on the work that's produced by women? Oh, as in the, the kind of knowledge of, of how, the, how the work is framed, is that what you mean? Like how that affects the writing now? The writing. Oh, wait, I think well, I think yeah. Um, I think that they always talk about like different difficult second album, difficult second novel. <laughs> I mean, I've just I've just <laughs> chucked out a kind of quite a substantial bit of a manuscript. So I, I don't know. It, you know, it does definitely. You know, a level of self-consciousness like does kind of feed into the process the second time around post-publication. I, I would be lying or naive to pretend otherwise, but I think to me, like the most important thing is just getting to the kind of what I what I what I think is like the emotional core of of the story and not not letting sort of the ego or like other things like that get in the way. And I think part of that part of that negative um, effect on on writing would be thinking too much about about those kinds of discussions while you're trying to work on the story, which, which I think, as, as Ding said, was really about trying to write the story that you want to write, right? Which is, and then everything else will follow, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Anything to, to add? Yeah. I mean, I had the same experience where I was asked if um, uh, anything, each time I'm 
I'm speaking in advance, if, if there's any of me in a novel. I don't hear that question asked much of male, yeah, for male, male authors. Writers. And <clears throat> I think, again, I think this is a great time for female writers. Because there's so much that um, they're, they're given, I think, a lot more space to just write about what they really do want to write about. Like, for example, Charlene said, the complexities of being a woman, um, it's so much more to talk about than uh, just, you know, like uh, passing the Bechdel test and not just talking about men. And even though uh, Cheryl's novel is, uh, the premise is, you know, on the surface, it's about getting an Ang Mo. It's not about that at all. It's about a woman trying to find herself and uh, um, trying to free her friends in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Not quite getting there, but still trying really hard anyway, and cursing a lot in the meantime, which is great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's, it's really great to see that uh, <coughs> the, 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 the different ways women are kind of um, expressing themselves on the page. And I think being empowered through words as well, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely agree with both of them. But it is true that women do get a different sort, sort set of questions. I think there was a, I forget which writer it was, she tweeted that, uh, there, was a, there was an interview or she tweeted, tweeted she said, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to answer this question because men don't get asked this question. And, 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 and it is, oh, you're on book tour right now. Who's watching your kids while you're on yeah. book tour? And, you know, she's like, I don't see any male writers getting asked that question. <laughs> yeah, or how do you juggle? Yeah, being, being a, a mom, being a mom, being and a writer. You know. yeah. It's only for women, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, and um, next question from the floor. This gentleman in the front here. Um, thanks. It sounds as though most of you live overseas. I may have got that wrong from the introduction. So I was kind of curious to hear how the books that you wrote were received where you live versus in Singapore, where presumably you've all been marketing the books as well. Well, I can tell you that in Singapore, um, Cheryl's book has topped our bestseller list for 32 weeks. Um, Ponty over here from Charlene was voted the Straits Times, one of the Straits Times best books for 2018. And uh, Jing Jing's book, I can't tell you what's going to be the best book of this year, but um, just wait and see. <laughs> but. Um, perhaps they can talk about how it was received in each of their respective c cities and countries. Well, I think it depends on um, who who's talking to you and who's interviewing you. Um, I I encount I did encounter some um, some some people who thought that um, this was very insulting to Singaporean men, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 a reporter at a place I will not name. Um, asked me, um, what made you, it was like the first question, and he was like profiling me, like, what made you decide to, to write about a type of person who is such a bad example for women in Singapore? And I was like, wow, <laughs> okay, we know where this is going. <laughs> um, and so I tried to say, well, you know, I don't think Nabokov is necessarily pro-pedophilia, and, you know, and he, <laughs> and he was, was sort of like, you know. But, um, but I think that the tendency sometimes when, um, when, uh, when a book is set in a, in a certain place, um, is to sort of see yourself in that book. And that's not necessarily the case, you know. It's, as Charlene said, you know, we are capable of writing fiction. Um, and, um, and so, you know, so sometimes you, you kind of have to deal with that. But overall, you know, it's been, it's been great. I mean, it's been interesting to, to explain Singlish in particular to, um, to, you know, newspapers, to journalists um, in, you know, America and the UK. Um, and having them be interested in it. And, and I, re I really, really love that because I love Singlish very much. So I'm very excited when people you know, say, you know, I, c I can't stop using the word confirm now or you know, something like that. <laughs> uh, I think my book has been largely um, pretty well received in Singapore. The thing is I have not had the opportunity to uh, do a launch just yet because I haven't been back since. It's doing well. <laughs> um, but yeah, it'd be it'd be lovely to go and see what it's like. Yeah. Um, next question, maybe at the at the back there. Uh, 
Um, this Hi, uh, my question is for Cheryl. So um, back in Singapore, we actually did this book in my uni as part of a module. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And uh, one of the like primary questions that we had during the discussion was your choice to use Singlish. Because you know in Singapore, there's the Speak English movement everywhere, like plastered at every bus stop. So I was wondering, um, like, why did you decide to go against it, and what was the reception from like the media, especially? Were like, especially like, were there like reviews that were critiquing that part of your book? Oh well, are we being, we're being taped, right? Okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm very aware of the Speak Good English campaign, and it's actually part of the reason. I mean, I didn't choose to write this book in Singlish because of it, but I was very happy to, to put Singlish out there in the world um, at a time when um, people were actively um, being encouraged by the government to speak less Singlish. Um, and I understand the re all the reasons why. Uh, and, and even in my own home, in my, you know, my generation when we were growing up, my parents were like, you know, speak proper English. You know, Queen's English or proper English, don't speak Singlish. Um, and so, but I've, I've always been somebody who, if you tell me to do something, I'll do the other thing. So, <laughs> um, so I guess the book sort of came out of that as well. But, um, you know, to me, I grew up in a generation in Singapore where we spoke Mandarin, we learned Mandarin, we spoke Mandarin, we were, we were actively discouraged from learning our grandmother's, dial our gra grandmother's dialect. So one big regret that I have is that I don't speak Teochew, which is my father's mother's dialect very well. I don't speak Hokkien, my mother's mother's dialect very well. Um, and I would hate to see Singlish just sort of phased out. And I don't think it will because everybody speaks Singlish to some degree in Singapore. It's, you know, it's a, you might speak a little bit of this, you might speak a lot of, a lot of Singlish. Um, so I don't think it's going to get phased out. But um, I love so celebrating, um, you know, the otherness of it. Um, it's something that's so uniquely Singaporean. And I just really wanted to share it with the world. Um, next question. From over there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, we'll we'll get there. Uh, uh, I mean, I think one of the s interesting things about fiction is that we can sort of um, empathise with either sex. And I wonder, have you ever thought of writing in a man's voice? Good question. Uh, I actually did, and I chucked the whole thing out. <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, Kevin is a 12-year-old boy, so that counts. Mm. But I think I could, mm, I could do it. But it involves quite a bit of a mind shift. And I, didn't, I found that I did not like to be in, uh, um, the, 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 one, the bits that I checked out were about his father, actually. So I did like to be in his father's head, and it didn't feel right. But it would be an interesting exercise to write an entire book, I think, mm. in yeah, a male's voice. But uh, it, it's, again, it's about wanting, wanting to be in that person's shoes. So you have to find a character you want to be Whether not with that character for a just very long time. To you and yeah, it's about having a friendship. It's about finding a person you want to live with for a really long time, too, because you have to live with the voice in your head. Mm. So yeah, you have to like the voice. I, I think that a lot of kind of norms around gender and how gender is performed and everything, you know, th these are kind of socially constructed, right? They're imposed on us. And I think male and female consciousnesses are a lot more similar than we think. So, yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I don't set out thinking, I'm gonna do this in a female character's voice or a male character's voice. Um, it just sort of, you know, who's the best, what's the story I want to tell and who's the best storyteller? Um, and that's just sort of how it evolves, um, yeah, so. Okay, um, next question. We can get one from that room over there. That room. <laughs> Hi, I was interested in whether um, in different markets they had different covers and they were marketed in a slightly different way. We can show you the cover <laughs> here in... Uh, um, okay, we can show you the, the US cover. Which the US cover looks like this for, for Cheryl's book. <laughs> 
looks like this. <laughs> which uh, we had chosen a very different cover, and then the marketing department thought that it should look like this, which is absolutely not what Jazzy is really. But yeah. but this is the beautiful UK cover, <laughs> which is what we should have had. <laughs> um, and it's sort of this sort of like it's very simple, elegant uh, neon batik. So. I think, uh, but I think that's sort of the, the that's sort of the reality of the situation. That I think American publishers tend to think very differently in terms of marketing books and trying to put you in boxes and making and and that's very much the case for um, especially female writers. Whereas I feel very very lucky and very fortunate that my UK publisher doesn't. I mean, it's like you know, it's like absolutely out of. It's like you know, of course we want it to have the best cover and like it has to reflect. And, the I, book. and I think also, I mean, with with Ponty, I mean, this is the cover that. I have, and then this this print has a uh, different cover as well. Holding up my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, my, my favorite, one of my favorite parts of the whole publishing experience has been seeing different covers and different, I love what the Brazilian publisher did. They, they drew like these, they, they mocked up several Ponty posters and they, they had this like merlion sleeve that, that the book went into, seriously. So it's really, really cool just seeing what different, mm. different countries come up with, mm. yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I love my UK cover, yeah, not just because my publisher is here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really do, and I, I fell in love with, it took uh, so many iterations. Who is this person on the front, or is it an image, or? Um, I actually found the woman looking up uh, photos of uh, women in the 60s. You so found it? You found yeah, it? I found That's it. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, so and, cool. Um, Everybody. In case you haven't seen it, and, and I'm sure I mean, you'll get to meet the authors after this as well. The, the American cover is very different. The Dutch cover is completely different because they used um, a little boy instead. Mm. Um, and he, um, they had the photographer's son run through a field. And it was, it's a beautiful cover, but it's completely different from the, the, the other two. So yeah, it's interesting to, to see how different societies or cultures want to portray yeah. Yeah, on the front. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next question. I think there were, there were some here at the, in this corner. In that row, um, the lady in the picture. I wanted to ask how long it took you to write these books and how many languages was it translated into each one of your books? It took me about um, three years, I think. But before that, I had a whole kind of novella length uh, failed novel where I wrote about like the Pontianak in first person. She was like flying around and poking meat and stuff. <laughs> that didn't work though, she was too powerful. At the end, she crawls into the internet. Um, goes nowhere. She met another Pontianak with a really bad haircut. <laughs> that was the whole novel. But I'm making it sound more exciting than this one. This one's, this one's more exciting. Um, but yeah, three, three years and nine languages. Um, it took me seven years in total, and it's uh, right now it's in two, and then it will be translated into Italian very soon. Um, I wrote the first draft of this book um, relatively quickly, I guess. It was in about a year and a half, but I then I spent about a year and a half revising it. Um, so I guess altogether three years. Um, and it actually hasn't been translated into anything else. Um, I wonder if it's because English is difficult. It's untranslatable. <laughs> Okay, next question. Here, Mike. Hi, um, my question is, how do you think your identity as Singaporean or Singaporeans have evolved to being away from home? Sort of looking back at Singapore, you know, living abroad, how has it evolved? And how has that affected your writing, basically? I mean, I have the privilege of being uh, in Singapore uh, being Chinese Singaporean, you know, the majority race, Ed, that is. Uh, so coming out of that little island and going into go, going to Europe, um, all of a sudden I was Asian, I was of color, and I was someone else, someone different. And all these people had so many different stereotypes running through the heads, good and bad. And the first few years that I lived, I first lived in Germany, mm, and I, it took me a long time to come to grips with the fact that people had all these um, 
weird issues to do with Asian women and how, and also how they can speak to Asian women. And coming out of Singapore where, you know, as Chinese Singaporean, you are basically colorless. You are, you can do whatever you want. Um, you're not, like in, in, in Singapore, I think um, Malay and Indian people have bear the brunt of being the colored ones. So they have to bear the burden of being seen by Chinese Singaporeans as someone else. Uh, where, um, so it gave me kind of the um, extra empathy, I think, living in Europe and suddenly having to deal with this, the, 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 you know, the stereotypes that people have foisted upon you just because they know very little else. Um, so, yeah. My, uh, my friends and some of my family like to say that I became more Singaporean when I left Singapore. Because I think when you're away from something, when you're, you're the other, you realize what you've left behind. And it becomes that much more intense for you every time you experience it. I mean, just the other day, I was looking at a picture of Sate that the Singapore High Commission here uh, like posted. Oh, there's a new Singaporean restaurant, by the way, Singapura. Everybody should go. Um, and I almost wept. I'm not kidding, because I was just all of a sudden so homesick, and I wanted to eat this photograph so much. Um, and and also, it's the same goes with language, especially. I mean, if my mom were to call me right now, we would just descend into this level of Singlish that's like just you know you would not believe. Um, and uh, even though we're not supposed to speak it, um, but you know, and it, I think that what it has is it's, it's made everything Singaporean that much more intense for me. And so when I see it and I recognize it and I experience it, um, I, I sort of write it down and as, as much as I can. Uh, and the same thing is, you know, it's the same thing when I'm home. It's like my friends, um, you know, don't see everything as sort of being sort of, sort of normal. Like I remember when Tiger in the Kitchen came out, they're like, <sighs> why are you so nostalgic for Tao Yuba? It's like this braised pork dish. It's like, we eat it every Sunday. I'm like, yes, you eat it every Sunday. I don't, you know, and it's, it's, that, it's that, that kind of difference. I realize what's special because I've left it behind and I don't have it every day. My whole family still lives there, so I get to go back, but you know, it's not a part of my everyday. And, um, and so I try to sort of hold that to me. Do you want to add something, Charlene? Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really excellent question and one I think about like all the time. Um, I think it, it, it's, um, th you know, there's so much to unpack. I don't really have a kind of clear answer about it. I think it's just a question of having lived away for so long, um, trying to um, reaffirm the kind of legitimacy of my position without feeling like I'm kind of betraying something or like losing some essence of myself. So like, I'm a deeply Singaporean person, I'm very proud of that. I don't feel English or I don't really necessarily feel at home here but this is where I kind of work, you know, and where I live. So it's that kind of form of reckoning and trying to represent that in fiction. So like feeling like I don't belong fully in either position. So I'm kind of in this kind of in-between state. So how do you make that into, into fiction? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. We'll take a few more questions. Yeah, the, this lady in the beige sweater Um, hi, so uh, this question is for Jingjing, but like all of the panel too. You talked about how you translated from speaking like Mandarin into English. So when you write your books in English, how do you really capture the essence of Singapore or the culture? Because language is so embedded in like thoughts and the culture there. Um, wait, maybe this isn't the right question because Singapore uses English primarily, but you did say that you used a lot of like Mandarin, like Chinese references yes. as well? Well, in my family, I grew up speaking Chinese. So it's natural for me to have a lot of um, the, the dialogue within the family be in first in Chinese, which I then translate to English. But if I think about it too hard, it would come out stilted, I think. Um, and that your question kind of, um, made that very clear to me. Because if I thought about how I would put Singapore on the page and how I would translate my culture onto the page, if I thought about it too hard, it will not come out right. And I think it also helps if you are working with people who understand that you don't want to explain yourself too much, which also kind of goes back to the previous question. As a Singaporean, how do you express yourself on the international stage? How has being Singaporean informed your writerly choices. 
and it can only come out naturally if you already think in a certain way and if you write in a certain way. There's not much I can do about wanting to express, um, I, can't, I can't go, I want to be as Singaporean <laughs> as I can on a page. It would be terribly difficult. Um, so again, I think for me writing Kark's back most of the time to really thinking and listening to that writerly voice and bridging the gap between being your literary self and trying to achieve a literary goal and listening to that voice. I think that's kind of where yeah, the magic happens. Yeah. First of all, I would not recommend trying to do anything specifically literary as you write. First, I would recommend you listening to the voice. Yeah. For me, a lot of it comes from character. I feel like I, I have a sense of the story I want to tell, and then who's the best storyteller, male or female, and then sort of building that character and letting that character inhabit my head. And it's like once I start to dream like in the voice of that character is when I know I'm like, okay, I'm there. It's like, the, it's like getting the frequency on the radio, you know? You know I guess I'm dating myself there, but you know, you, <laughs> yeah, you turn the knob and you know when it's right, and then it's like, okay, that's it, let's go. Okay, um, next question. There's over this, this side here. Hello, uh, thank you very much for reading. I enjoyed your work all very much. Um, so I was born to a Malay family in Singapore, and then we moved to Sydney in the 90s, like loads of families. And I think you touched on it that I was just racialized as Asian, you know, that kind of thing that happens. Um, and I think as I got older, I tried to, um, to reconnect with the Singaporean identity, Singaporean history a bit. Um, and I kind of get the sense that Singapore at the moment is going through like a bit of a identity crisis, or so like a lot of things are kind of happening at the moment. Um, you might disagree with me about that. There are some of the news at the moment about NUS Yale and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the question to all of you, do you think uh, Singaporean identity is, is strengthening in this sort of globalization age, or is it weakening? Um, how much do you think this is reflected in literature? And, and I, think, I don't want to point out, but all of you are kind of Chinese background, right? And do you, how, do, how much do you feel like the other races in Singapore are able to contribute to kind of the literary scene or the literary dialogue or Singaporeanness or anything like that? Anyway, thank you. I think that's, that's a really fantastic question. Um, I always think of like what I can, what I feel I have the kind of authority to comment on and because I'm not, I'm not at home in Singapore most of the time, I don't feel that like I know the kind of scene in terms of like from, from the, on the ground, so to speak. But from my impression, I, I think that, um, yeah, because we're such a young country, so you know, you're only talking about developing the kind of what they call the Anglophone canon from say like the 60s onward, that is incredibly recent. So for that, for that reason, you know, it, it, is very, um, it is very subject to change. It's protean, it's, it's exciting. Um, I think that, yeah, we can't ignore the fact that as, as um, ethnic Chinese Singaporeans, we definitely are massively privileged. Um, and, and as the majority um, kind of ethnicity, that, that also plays a part in, in terms of representation thus far. But I think even in the last 10 years, you, you, you see a lot more diversity. You see a lot more of these different voices. Um, I, I think the poetry scene is absolutely booming. Um, there's always been a very vibrant short story scene as well. So I think recently there's been a whole influx of novels. I have to say all from women. <laughs> so Singaporean men, where are you at? You come out of the sarang party guys. <laughs> that kind of thing, that perspective. I would love to read that. Um, so I think, I think it, it is really evolving and changing. And um, things like um, social media and the internet, they have really democratized um, people getting their work out, people forming networks of readers and writers. Um, I, I don't want to sound all Disney and optimistic, but I mean, that, that is a kind of upside to the kind of uh, catastrophe that we're going through now in terms of the world ending. And, well, the national, <laughs> as opposed, and uh, to address the part about other uh, writers of other ethnicities contributing to the literary scene, the National Arts Council in Singapore is actually um, very uh, actively, has always, has often very actively encouraged um, uh, writers to write in Tamil, Mandarin, and mm -hmm. Malay as well. They give uh, awards out, they give stipends, they give grants 
um, every year to, to writers who, who write in those languages. And I've always been very, very impressed by that because they, they try to give like the same amount to people you know, writing in English, you know, Tamil. Like the golden point. Yeah, yeah and exactly. And I find that very admirable because to them, the Arts Council wants to acknowledge that, um, that you know, s we are, we're not just one kind of writing. We're not just one yeah. ethnic voice um, that we have to kind of, you know, preserve that. The Arts Council has been very consistently supportive of writers, different, different languages. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think well, there's a woman Yeah, there. we'll take a, a question from over here. Oh, I like that room. <laughs> um, thank, you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank um, you. I'm really interested to know what you all think about this idea that you have transnational identities, you live between languages, cultures, passports, identities, and yet in the act of writing, perhaps when you talk about where you belong, in fact you might be perfectly at home nowhere, meaning now and here, because we all live between these spaces and yet somehow your writing resonates for us today. Well, I think it'll be really hard to, for me right now, to translate that onto a page because I am a person who needs to feel at home somewhere and the liminal space between here and there, it's, for me, that's really hard to capture. Um, I would love to try because that, I think is, that is a dilemma within you know, modern humans because we travel so much. So many of us live away from home in some way and I think for the, the three of us, writing about Singapore is a way of connecting as mm. well. Mm. Um, uh, I, so I think getting to the point where I can write about something really true and honest and have that space be embedded within a real, um, like something that feels right between Singapore and wherever I am, that would take time. And I would love to work on that. I, I'm trying to work on that right now, actually. So, yeah. Um, I've lived in the States for over 20 years now. And, and for a chunk of that, I lived in Brooklyn. And, um, and my family in Singapore would be like, why don't you just write a novel that's set in Brooklyn? Everybody seems to like that. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, well, I guess, you know, maybe I would one day write a novel set in Brooklyn, but I probably would have to live in Singapore to be able to write that novel. <laughs> um, you know, I have to be, I, I, I don't, um, I actually still think of Singapore as home, even though I've lived away for so many years. Um, I, I feel very Singaporean. Um, I will never give up my passport. I'm not just saying that because this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's very much a part of my identity, and I, I don't know what I would be if I was not Singaporean. Um, you know, and I, I obviously, I've lived in America for, for so long, I could have become American many years ago, and, um, and, um, and I'm not, so. I, I think um, a very, very key part of um, growing up in Singapore for me was just always feeling like at the confluence of different cultural influences like from all over the world a and like growing up in a very multicultural, multilingual society. Uh, that was something I always felt very deeply. Um, but the, the truth is I, I've always felt like an outsider all the time. Sometimes I even forget I have a body. I just feel like eyeballs. <laughs> so I don't, know what, I don't know how that will translate into a story. <laughs> Thank you. We'll yeah. have last two questions um, and there's one over this side as well. Yeah, thanks very much for this. This has been a fascinating discussion, and it's interesting that at the end we get to talking about home. Do the three of you ever see yourselves returning to Singapore to live? I want to point out, by the way, that's uh, Frank Langfitt, who um, works for NPR. He's uh, based here, and he's a wonderful, and he's also written a wonderful book um, that everybody should read, Shanghai Taxi. Um, but um, I do sometimes think that I might, my dream all, for many years was to go um, to spend my time, half my time in Singapore and half my time in New York or in the States somewhere. Um, and I feel very fortunate because I sort of get to do that now. I get to go home whenever I want. Um, last summer I spent six weeks um, in Singapore with my dad watching the World Cup and writing there, which was magical. So, um, so I, I see, um, I see, I guess I, I do, now I'm changing my, question, my answer to the last question. I see home being sort of in two places, um, although Singapore is the primary home. Um, but of course, if my parents need me, I, I would always move home. Do you I guys see yourself moving back anytime soon? I think I would find it really difficult to live in Singapore because I feel so passionately about it. And I get really angry when I'm back home. 
<laughs> about everything, ev you know, from, from the personal to the political. Everything gets me mad. I so guess stepping away, you get to see yeah, it a little bit better. I can only write about Singapore if I'm away from it. That's the thing. Then I can be cool enough to write about it. If not, <laughs> I'm just angry. Um, yeah. I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out if... I think I'm, I'm just very much governed by what I think would be best for my writing. Um, yeah, I think the thing with every time I go home, and I think everyone that's emigrated can feel the same, is that you become kind of like, you know, in a MacBook, like a time capsule, a time machine. I kind of feel this massive sort of nostalgic regression, and I'm just worried if I, if I, if I was there for too long, I'd become like, you know, 18-year-old me again who's really not very wise and kind of irritating. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I wouldn't rule it out at all. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Okay, um, last question. Last question. We have, um, the, I think, a gentleman in the red sweater at the back. Sorry, I, I can't... I, I just see a red, red sweater arm. Hi there, thanks very much. Sorry, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't see your face. Yeah, but, but yeah, you, yes. That's okay. You're, you can't really see me from your vantage point, I guess. Um, uh, I just really wanted to ask a question about uh, whether there are any Singaporean writers in particular who have influenced you. Um, growing up in Singapore, I always thought that Singapore had a brilliant literature scene. There are people like Catherine Lim, people like Philip J. Ratnam. There were fantastic teenage fiction books like the teenage textbook and workbook by Adrian Lee, Singapore horror stories, even lots of stories about Pontianaks. Um, so it'd be really interesting to hear whether or not any of those writers have actually influenced your work. Good question. Um, yeah, when I was growing up, especially when I was a teenager, um, I, I went to this kind of uh, creative writing camp um, a couple of times, it was a creative arts program. And um, from then I encountered the work of Cyril Wong, who's still one of my absolute favorite poets. He's just such a beautiful, amazing writer with a wonderful turn of phrase. I love his stuff very much. Um, and there's a short story writer called Ta Mei Ching, who I, I, I love as well. She's got a, a volume called Crossing Distance. And I remember reading it when I was maybe 15. And I'd never seen like, a world kind of like mine down to the emotional precision reflected so clearly back to me. And I thought like, well, I want to do that one day. Yeah. I'm seconding Cyril over here. He's, yeah. he's really fantastic. Um, and um, you know, I grew up uh, sort of in a slightly different generation. Um, and so I grew up with a lot of the really kind of slightly earlier writers. Um, Colin Cheung was someone that, who, whom I loved. I like Philip Gerard as well. Um, and um, and more and Ovidia Yu, um, if you she's incredibly prolific. Uh, she's a playwright as well as a novelist, and she currently writes this um, um, mystery series uh, that's uh, sort of like this Peranakan auntie solves mysteries while cooking. Um, and it's 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 uh, it's very sweet. Um, so I would recommend that. Great. Um, and that brings us to the end of our session tonight. And I hope you've enjoyed yourself and you've been enriched in some way by our three talented Singaporean authors. Thank you.